Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You know that scene in action movies where someone is handcuffed to a pipe or something or their clothes are improbably caught on a hook while the room or the car that they're in is filling up with water? That scene is in so many movies. Well, that's the predicament that Andrew Tate's fans are in right now with every successive leak of evidence from the Romanian prosecutor's office. They have attached themselves to this guy and it's gonna be hard to pry themselves loose to avoid drowning in the reality that they've been had. Tate used the so-called lover boy method to lure women to Romania under the pretense of starting a serious relationship with them or even marrying them, only to then trap them into doing webcam porn for him in a strange country with no passports no contacts, using threats, violence, and psychological abuse to keep them compliant. And he's basically used that same lover boy strategy with the young men who are his fans, promising them that he cares about them and convincing them that they need him and that he is the savior who will lead them out of the matrix, only to then extort their insecurities and general frustration getting thousands of dollars from them by selling them courses on ideas for working in the gig economy or tactics and strategies for how to browbeat and manipulate women. Andrew Tate is a vile and violent con man who preyed on the weakness and gullibility of women, of men, and yes, of Muslims. There are many who are still in denial about this. And I've seen this phenomenon many times in my work because most of my clients are human rights and legal organizations, and we come across scamming victims all the time. Mostly women who have been duped by romance scammers, usually posing as pilots for some reason, convincing them that they love them, they love bomb them, make them fall in love with them, and then they tell them, uh, I've been arrested in Dubai and I need money for bail, I need money for fines, I need money for this, for that, for the other. And the women send them, thousands and thousands of dollars. Even when we have explained to them that this is a scam, that this is a con, many women still hold out the hope that this person that they fell in love with is still honest and true and is maybe facing a catastrophe in their life and they still want to help, even after they've been scammed. It's hard to accept. I get it. It's embarrassing and it's disappointing. But ultimately, you cannot hold on to both your denial of the obvious and onto your dignity at the same time. It's time to cut your losses. Now, let me talk about a couple of things regarding Andrew Tate that I think need to be debunked. And the first is this idea about escaping the matrix. If by matrix, you mean some overarching system of societal control that more or less lays out the options for everyone in their life, demands their conformity, and punishes non-compliance by means of economic, reputational, or actual violence. Well, that sounds like Tate's mansion in Romania. So if you believe in this amorphous concept of the matrix as some sort of tyrannical system of domination and exploitation and control, I'm not sure how you can believe that creating a mini matrix in your home is a commendable way to escape it. But let's be honest. You will only refer to the power structure as the matrix, if you do not have the ability, the intelligence, or the information to understand the real power dynamics in society. And of course, if you do not understand power dynamics, you cannot conceivably navigate them. Using terms like the matrix is just an abstraction that lends itself to people who are generally disgruntled, who feel disempowered and ganged up on, and who don't know how to articulate that, and who don't know what to do about it. Now, I talk about the owners and controllers of global financialized capital, and fair enough, that's also vague. But it's certainly not as vague as the term the matrix, and it's more specific than saying something like the elites or the upper class. And I don't actually claim that this group of people runs the world. They control powerful economic, political, and culturally influential institutions and they use these institutions to protect and support their interests. But within the owners and controllers of capital, there are competing interests on a variety of issues. And we cannot say 
that they actually operate as a monolith and they and their institutions are susceptible to external pressures, particularly popular opposition. The socioeconomic system that is promoted by this class of people and their institutions is neoliberal capitalism, it's materialism, it's consumerism, it's selfishness and greed, because that is the sort of system in which they have the most advantages, and it is the sort of system through which they can consolidate those advantages. They're simply the biggest players in that game, so that's the game that they want everyone to play. Now, Andrew Tate is a psychopathic capitalist. He's a hyper-materialist, an absolute believer, zealot even, in the accumulation of extravagant wealth, the consumption of luxury, radical selfishness, and an absolute believer in the infallible logic of sociopathic exploitation manipulation, and self-promotion. He is, in every way, the spawn of amoral neoliberal extremism. If you asked an AI program to create a cartoon to represent delusional, predatory narcissism, it would create Andrew Tate. There is nothing whatsoever about Andrew Tate that challenges or even diverges from the ideology of the power structure. Wait, I'm not done. Tate's online courses in his Hustlers University offers advice on how to earn an income outside of the traditional workforce, i.e. how to make money uh, freelancing and doing side hustles. Now, obviously, this is nothing unique. The internet is full of these kinds of courses. But let's talk about what this really means in terms of the matrix. When you encourage workers to leave the labor force and to try to get by through the gig economy, you are promoting the depletion of workers from small and medium-sized businesses, which will likely cause them to fail, thus leaving only the largest corporations to further dominate the economy. And most of your side hustle ideas and most of your gig work will be for the benefit precisely of these corporations, except that you will be working for them for pennies, without benefits, without insurance, without health care, with no pension, and without the collective bargaining power of employees, such as through things like affiliate marketing for Amazon. This strategy does nothing but serve the interests of the largest corporate players in neoliberal capitalism. Other than this, Tate has offered, I think that he's deleted these courses now for probably legal reasons, he offered advice on how to manipulate women and how to be a pimp. Again, this is not a revolution against the system. This is completely in line with the ideology of the elite class. The trendiness, by the way, of disdain for labor is incredibly self-defeating. I mean, contempt for people who work nine to five jobs. This is so popular online to talk about. Contempt for people who work nine to five jobs mirrors the attitude of the corporate class. And it is profoundly contrary to Islamic values. In Islam, good, hard, honest work is praised and honorable. It's also counterproductive if you're talking about trying to break away from or break down the matrix, whatever that word means to you. It's completely counterproductive because historically, upholding the unparalleled value of workers and the working class has historically been the only approach that has led to society-wide improvements for everybody. You should regard every worker as vital and precious to the functioning of society. And you should be demanding that they be valued financially and in terms of social respect. Now, finally, and this is the key that will help you Release yourself from the handcuffs before the water rises above your head, i.e. the realization that Andrew Tate is a criminal. And that is this. Andrew Tate is not influential. I think the young generation has lost track of what this word actually means. Googling someone does not make them influential. Watching someone's content does not make them influential. Someone who is influential means someone who causes you to believe and behave differently in the real world. Someone who is influential causes people to emulate them. They are a role model in terms of how you actually behave and conduct yourself 
in the real world. No one who watches Andrew Tate is actually trying to speak and act like him. No one is trying to behave like him. No one is trying to do what he did unless they're mentally ill. Imitating Andrew Tate in real life would be the fastest imaginable way to alienate everyone you know. The fastest imaginable way to disgust every woman that you meet. And the fastest imaginable way to get punched in the face. No one is actually doing that. Andrew Tate is an algorithmically invented celebrity. Sure, undoubtedly, there are people who are followers of Andrew Tate who are imitating him in their online content, in their posts, in their comments, and so on. Online, but not in the real world. Because that would be social suicide. Andrew Tate is a parade float, not a role model. So please stop talking about Andrew Tate being the most influential man in the world. It's not true. The most influential man in the world today, tomorrow, and for the last 1,400 years is Muhammad al-Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nearly 2 billion people on this planet emulate him, imitate him as best they can. We follow him, we learn from him how to behave, how to be a man, how to be a husband, how to be a father, how to be a leader, how to do business, how to do and be everything that a person could ever do or be. We imitate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam down to the movement of a finger. There is no other, no better, and no more influential person in this world, nor in the history of this world, from the moment that the wahi came until the end of time. Now, I know that some of the die-hard Muslim fans of Andrew Tate will protest and say that the sins and the crimes that he committed before announcing his conversion to Islam should not be factored in to our judgment about the man. This is simply wrong. Andrew Tate may someday become a good man. He may someday become a sincere and righteous Muslim. And if and when that day comes, ahlan wa sahlan. But that's not who he is now. And that's not who or what he has ever been. The crimes that he committed and that he flaunted and the legitimate grievances of others against him are not nullified by the announcement of his conversion. When Qais ibn Asim confessed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he murdered his daughters in Jahiliyyah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't tell him, oh, don't worry about that, you converted. That's all in the past, it's all forgiven. No. He warned him that you have troubled days ahead of you. And he told him that you have to emancipate the same number of slaves as the number of daughters that you killed, hoping maybe that that will atone for what you did. His conversion to Islam did not nullify the culpability that he had for the crimes and the wrongs that he did prior to Islam because they involved other people's rights. And the same stands for Andrew Tate. I pray that Andrew Tate will become a good and righteous Muslim. And I pray that his victims will embrace Islam as well. And I hope that he and I hope that they and I hope that all of the Muslims who are applauding Andrew Tate today, I hope that all of them will return to the correct recognition that Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the most influential and the only worthwhile influencer. And I hope that they will understand that Islam offers the only true rescue from any and all corrupt and tyrannical systems of power. Love for the Akhirah is the solution to this corrupt system, not the love for the dunya on steroids as peddled by Andrew Tate. Jazakumullahu khairan wa assalamu alaikum.